but we also know that they can make models of what might be going on in the world. Our ancestor, Homo erectus, was lived oh, uh, a, a, a million years ago. And let's imagine that a particular female Homo erectus was trying to solve the problem how to get her family across a gorge like that. Nobody had ever built a bridge before. Bridge technology wasn't around. But she suddenly saw in her mind's eye a tree fallen across the gorge. And she realized that it could function as a bridge. She also thought, how can I get that to happen? And she's imagined, she saw in her imagination a fire at the base of the tree. She had the idea of burning the tree down to make it fall and make a bridge. Now this, of course, is entirely speculation. We don't know if that ever happened. We don't even know if it would have worked. The point I'm making is that she had a model in her head of a tree fallen across a gorge with fire, and that something hadn't yet happened. She was anticipating something that might happen in the future. And if you can do that, you've got a trick that's really worth having, because you can solve problems that other animals can't solve. So that's one possibility. Imaginative simulation may have been the software trick that took our species off. Another possibility is language. It's often been suggested, it's an obvious suggestion, because language seems tailor-made to get a piggyback spiral going. If you've got language, then each generation can learn from its predecessors, learn from the previous generation, learn from their mistakes, build on their experience. So maybe it was language. Unfortunately, there's a snag, there's some evidence that, um, uh, that language in the form of speech, at least, proper speaking, didn't arise until after the ballooning of the brain. But perhaps we can get out of that by suggesting that language had uh, an early apprenticeship in the form of a kind of sign language, or drawing in the sand. Or perhaps uh, language arose before actual speech arose as a sort of way of talking to yourself, to get your thoughts into a logical order, to plan your actions in a logical order. And only later, perhaps, did it become externalized in the form of speech, using the tongue, lips, and voice, so that brains became, as it were, networked together. We can also think of technology, tools, say, like these tools here, as external devices used by brains for extending the power of the hands, or other devices like telescopes and microscopes as devices for extending the power of the eye. Maybe it was technology that proved, that provided the breakthrough for humans to take off. So we've identified imagination, language and technology as three possible candidates for our trigger innovation. And perhaps all three played a role. Perhaps they reinforced each other in a three-way spiraling explosion. But each of those three mental tools, imagination, language and technology, is double-edged. If we use them aright, we can perhaps end up making a model of the universe. But the double edge is always there. Take imagination and the brilliant simulating software that we saw earlier. It can be immensely useful, but it can also have unfortunate consequences. A brain that's good at simulating models in imagination, things that aren't there, is unfortunately also, almost inevitably, in danger of self-delusion. How many of us have lain in bed terrified because we thought we saw a ghost or a monstrous face staring in the bedroom window? only to discover eventually that it was just a trick of the light, the moonlight playing on the curtains. We've seen from Charlie Chaplin how easy it is, how eager the brain is, to make a face, even when, that, when there's only a, a hollow bat to a mask. That same software can do the same trick if it sees some folds in the curtain that just happen to suggest eyes and nose and a mouth, perhaps. So we see a face when there isn't one there. Every night of our lives we dream. That same simulating software sets up worlds that don't exist, people, animals, countries that never existed, perhaps never could exist. At the time, we experienced those simulations as though they were reality. And why shouldn't we? Given that we habitually experience reality in just the same way, by looking at simulation models in our heads. The simulation software can delude us when we're awake, too. So I think the lesson from this is that if ever we hear a story that somebody has seen a vision 
been visited by an archangel, heard voices in his head, we should be immediately suspicious.